with the advent of social media, people get lots of advice and read things mm -hmm. online. And one of the big things, if you're a cat owner, that you'll see very commonly is cats should never eat kibble, which I agree with. However, I'm Dr. Judy Morgan from Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets and with me today I have Dr. Carrie Smith. She's one of those really smart people who I guess just like to stay in school for a long time because not only is she a holistic veterinarian, she's also a pharmacist. She's got a lot of stuff stored up there. Yeah, a little bit too much sometimes. <laughs> I can't imagine having all of that crammed in there. And I asked Carrie if she would come on and speak with me about fatty liver disease, also known as hepatic lipidosis, because it is something that I saw fairly often in practice, and you're still practicing, so yeah. do you see it? I have. I just saw it recently, actually. It was probably a middle-aged cat that hadn't been eating very well for a while. The people went out of town, um, and... I don't think the cat ate at all while they were gone and they came back and you know the cat was basically like lethargic out of it came in li liver values you know off the charts and was an overweight cat prior had lost a lot of weight in recent month or two and kind of led to the fatty liver disease so fatty liver disease is something that we can see in dogs but just really not common in dogs, but it is pretty common in kitty cats. Mm -hmm. And there can be a lot of reasons that this will develop, but the main factor that is kind of at the root of it is that they're just not eating well. They're not taking in enough calories. And so their body starts to break down fat stores and then that fat accumulates in the liver because the liver can't process it yeah, liver fast just, enough. They were really created to eat, you know, small, frequent meals, mice, small little animals throughout the day, very lean animals that like weren't meant to get, you know, really overweight on kibble. and Exactly. <laughs> and unfortunately, a lot of times, like the cat she was describing, the cat had been losing weight for a while. So clearly something was going on. There's an underlying factor there. So very commonly when we see this hepatic lipidosis in the cats, there can be something else going on. So there may be an inflammatory process. They may have a chronic pancreatitis or something called portal triad disease, which is actually inflammation of the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So that's like the holy grail of everything going bad. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes it's related to diabetes. Like inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease. And in dogs, it's commonly associated with things like diabetes, obesity, hypothyroidism, chronic pancreatitis. So it commonly goes along with the endocrine disorders. And we've talked about this a lot in the past, that when you have one endocrine disorder, many times you have multiple because all the glands work together. They don't work just by themselves. How did we go about diagnosing the fatty liver disease? You said that cat had a lot of elevated liver enzymes. Yeah, so, I mean, usually the first thing you'll do is some blood work, see how liver, kidney, everything's looking. Um, if it indicates there's some liver malfunction, I mean, ideally, if you have ultrasound available, you know, that is probably one of the next steps. Depending on, like, if some, like, bilirubin or some certain values are elevated, that kind of can give you some more clues. But if not, there's always further testing, like bile acids, that you can do to right. test liver function. And really, the gold standard for diagnosis is liver biopsy. Yes. But very commonly, these animals are so sick. Yep. that you're not going to be able to do the biopsy. So you have to base it on, look, I've got elevated liver enzymes. The bile acid tests are elevated. The cat's not eating. The cat's losing weight. And maybe the cat is getting to the point where they're becoming jaundiced, where they're turning yeah. yellow. Best places to look for that, by the way, whites of the eyes, inside the ear tips. Look mm -hmm. inside the ear. You'll see yellow there. Their gums, their tongue. Sometimes we'll see it if they have a kind of a hairless area on their belly and you flip them over, you might see that their skin looks a little bit yellow but by the time they're jaundiced they're in pretty advanced disease yes yes good news is depending on what the underlying cause is the lipidosis itself can be pretty treatable yeah with some intensive nutrition and you yeah. know intensive care supportive care 
Yeah, most of these cats will require a feeding tube yep. because they're not eating. And the most important part of treatment is calories, mm -hmm. getting calories, good, highly digestible, high quality proteins into these cats. Yeah. Really, really critical. So a lot of times that means having a feeding tube placed. And again, that's a little scary. We've got a cat who's sick, his liver isn't processing things very well, and we've got to sedate them, put them under anesthesia to get the feeding tube in. And then we're asking a liver that's not working to process the medications. Yeah. There certainly are sedatives and anesthetics that are processed more through the kidney. So we would use something along those lines to, to get this processed. And it's a pretty, pretty quick process to get the mm -hmm. feeding tubes in. But it requires a lot of commitment either from the veterinary care team or does. the pet owner. I mean, I've managed cats at my house with feeding tubes in, but clearly I have a little more... Yeah. expertise on that but I think most pet owners once they learn how to do it if they're really committed they can do the feeding yeah, tubes. Yeah I think it's pretty pretty straightforward once you get the hang of it. Yeah for getting um, for getting the nutrition into them and it's multiple small feedings that they have to have. I had a cat with a, a feeding tube in because she had cancer in her throat and so it was four to six times a day putting liquid nutrition yeah. into the tube for her and making sure the tubes don't get clogged, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. But then we're also going to do a lot of liver support for these animals. From a traditional standpoint, usually it's things like metronidazole as an antibiotic because yeah. that's pretty good for killing any Thing infectious in the liver. Sometimes uh, ursodiol. For, ursodiol help um, break down the, the fats in the food. Yep. Certainly uh, appetite enhancers, mm -hmm. anti-nausea medications, anti -nausea, yep. fluids. Sometimes they'll do things like either like B12, you know, since that can be low in chronic GI disease or, you know, some other vitamin supplements. You know, like it's interesting. Well. When I was in practice, we never tested those cats for vitamin D levels. And I would bet that most of them probably have low vitamin D as well. I think that's a way under utilized test yeah, in general. But, I do too. I think um, we should always be testing yeah. for that. So my head technician had two cats and one of her cats developed fatty liver disease. We have no idea what the underlying cause mm -hmm. was. So of course, being a more holistic practice, we were like, okay, how are we gonna deal with this and avoid all the medications and things that actually might tax the body in addition? So we actually were very successful with her cat. We put, placed a feeding tube. She had to bring the cat to work with her every day because she had long days so she could feed the cat throughout the day. But we used a lot of herbal and things that are more of a nutraceutical okay. method for treatment. So we use SAM-E, mm -hmm. which is just a great antioxidant, really good for liver support. Mm -hmm. We used milk thistle, and we're going back probably 20 years on this, so I, we didn't have near as much, yeah, so much available knowledge. Like there are so many things. Now I would be looking at dandelion tinctures mm -hmm. and you know so many things, and I, I w at this point, I would be making my own recipe mm -hmm. that I would be pulling pulverizing and liquefying to put through that feeding tube instead of when you if you read about this online what you're going to see in all the descriptions and use the prescription diet to put into the feeding tube that's mm -hmm. highly digestible blah 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 but you do need something that is a uh, high caloric density yeah because you want to get as much power in that smallest amount of food that you can yeah. and pretty high protein yeah well, it's, it's a cat. They're, yeah. they're carnivores. Yeah. And, and frankly, for the dogs, I would go for that high-protein, easily digestible food as well. Mm -hmm. The cat that you saw recently, did that one get a that feeding one, tube? Did that one survive? That one ended up getting sent over to, you know, one of the emergency 24-hour clinics. It did survive the short term. Unfortunately, it ended up having lymphoma, I believe. So it so, unfortunately didn't make so it. So there's the underlying cause exactly. for why the cat was losing weight. And then the fatty liver disease was just a secondary exactly. problem that occurred because there was a primary yeah. problem keeping the cat yeah, from eating. He did well. come I think he spent a couple days at the at the ER or in the intensive care and then came home with a feeding tube and so they, you know, went through you have to be careful too about, you know, not feeding too much too fast in the beginning because of overfeeding syndrome, but eventually got him back, you know, with nutrition, but 
Yeah, unfortunately, the underlying cause wasn't a good one for him. Right. So it's really critical if you have a cat that develops hepatic lipidosis or fatty liver syndrome that you do the diagnostics to figure out. So definitely abdominal ultrasound, mm -hmm. uh, CBC, chem, urinalysis, maybe some endocrine testing, testing for viral problems that might be underlying, FILUC, mm -hmm. FIV, especially if your cats go outside. And in this particular case, looking for that underlying cancer. And inflammatory bowel disease in cats can be really a tricky diagnosis because on ultrasound you can't tell the difference right. between intestinal lymphoma and IBD. They look very similar. Yeah. Uh, so the only way to really get that is with biopsies. However, VDI Labs does have a great test that differentiates between the two. We talked about underlying disease problems that could throw a cat into hepatic lipidosis. However, the other time that we'll see it, and I think this has become actually more common because with the advent of social media, people get lots of advice and read things mm -hmm. online. And one of the big things, if you're a cat owner, that you'll see very commonly is cats should never eat kibble, which I agree with. However, if you have a kibble eating cat and you want to change them to something else, say you want to change them to a high moisture diet, a gently cooked diet, a raw diet, your cat's not used to eating that. Yeah, they probably might not even recognize it as food right away. Exactly. They're just so used to like the processed little dry little kibble that yep. they think, you know, this and is food. You know, there is a lot of science that goes into that. These pet food companies spend millions of dollars figuring out which shape and texture mm -hmm. of the kibble. The cats like the best. And actually, and I don't see this in the kibble very often, but what they like the most is these little kind of flat football shapes, mm -hmm. which is really so weird that somebody did all the research to figure that out. But basically they put multiple bowls of food out it's same food in different yeah. shapes, and they see which ones they gravitate it's so to. so interesting. Yeah. So it's the smell, the taste, the texture, the shape. I, there's so much that goes into it. And the pet food companies know this. That's what they do the research on. But a cat is a creature of habit. Mm -hmm. So if you want your cat to be a, a raw food eater, if you start them as kittens, like all of my cats were started as kittens, right onto their raw food. So piece of cake for them. They're, yeah. they're just like- The younger they are, definitely the Yeah, this is what is. we do. What's interesting though, is you can take a raw fed cat and you can put kibble in front of them. I call it kitty crack. They will dive in their head first. <laughs> they yeah, will they will inhale it. And it's because it's got palatins. So it's got appetite enhancers yeah. on it. Really bad stuff. It's mm -hmm. like, here, have some sugar, some salt, some MSG. Yeah. You'll love it. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> anyway, so, but if you see this and then people are saying, oh, you, you have to stop the kibble. If you stop the kibble and put something out that your cat doesn't recognize as food, which happened when I first started feeding raw, I, I had two cats and I put the raw out and that was when we were feeding the little kind of round hockey puck ones. And that's what they treated it as. They literally like batted it around yeah. the room and walked and they were like, I don't know what this is. I'm yeah. not, I'm not going to eat it. So the worst thing you can do with your cat is have the attitude of yeah a lot of people think oh, if he gets hungry, hungry enough <laughs> he'll eat it and they won't the yeah. cats are stubborn yeah yeah that's not the best the best method you know uh usually i'll tell people because if their cat's really struggling with that transition that you know just add a little bit of that raw food right next to their normal kibble or wet food um canned food and it might take months like up to six months and then eventually one day they will eat it and then it's just kind of like a light bulb goes off and then yeah. kind of helps to, you know start that transition but you do kind of have to cater to them a little bit you do <laughs> you can't you cannot starve a cat into it because they literally will starve themselves to death and develop fatty liver syndrome and then you've got a much bigger issue that's a bigger problem to fix the longest one that i ever had took six months it was an adult cat who had been fed kibble because i didn't know any better at the time i started with the raw frozen raw and warmed it up and they said, no, we're not, we're mm -hmm. not doing that. So then I found freeze dried and freeze dried wasn't really common back then. And I started sprinkling that in the food. Yeah, so the help. texture was very similar, but mm -hmm. the taste was very different. Then once I got them to accept that, then I could start adding little bits of water to it until I got it rehydrated to where I wanted it to be. So that's been one of my methods to get them switched over. But it might mean going from a kibble to uh, canned mm -hmm. um, yeah, because like that's got gradual. some of the flavor enhancing things in it as well depending on the can some of them have more carbs in it than what a 
raw or freeze dried food would have. So we can sometimes gradually start to yeah, change move their them. taste buds a yeah. little bit over time. And uh, they're also really picky about the texture. Some of them don't like things soupy. So for those of you who feed canned foods to your cat, there are cats that like the pate. There are cats that like the chunks in gravy. Mm -hmm. There are cats who like it a little bit soupy. If they like one, they're probably not going to like the other. Yeah. The, it's for them, it, it is a taste, a texture, a yeah. feel. I mean, it's just little, I definitely little kitty cat that. brains. Yeah. I have seven cats, and each one of them has a different preference. So. Yeah, yeah. Different protein, different texture, different yes. liquid and that's, amount. And that everything. is the other thing, protein. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're feeding a chicken-based kibble and you want to get them moved over, start with a chicken-based whatever other food that you're going to feed. Like my cats, most of them don't like beef. They like pork, they like venison, which seems a little weird. I know, that does seem weird. <laughs> you know, I always look at them and I'm like, okay, so in the wild... Which one of you is going out and taking down the deer? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or taking down the pig. Like, I, I think of cats eating, you know, rabbits and mice and yeah. birds and little things. Yep. But it is interesting because mine, I, pretty much everybody loves pork. Yeah, mine all love pork too. Really weird. Really uh -huh. weird. Anyway, so take good care of your kitties. If you notice that your cat is losing weight, which can be very subtle, it can be very gradual. If you're going away and somebody else is taking care of your cat, make sure they, they take notice of whether the cat is eating. Particularly if you feed kibble free choice and you're just filling the bowl up, mm -hmm. Pay attention to whether the bowl is going down, whether they're eating. Most cats that eat kibble are grazers. They go back and forth and back and forth. And if you don't see your cat going back and forth to the bowl, you might have a problem. If they've got excessive vomiting, if they're having diarrhea issues, uh, if they're more lethargic than usual, if their coat starts getting that clumpy, greasy look, yeah. that's that's always a sign of a sick Something's cat. Going on. So just pay attention to what your cat is doing, and if you are trying to transition them, make sure that you are gradual with it, and don't try to starve your kitties, because they will Yeah. literally starve. Yeah, they'll stick to it. <laughs> well, thank you very much yeah, for joining for me, me today. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Everybody take care of your kitties, and uh, if you've ever ha dealt with a cat with this problem, Put in the comments below how your cat did, how it was treated, whether you use natural methods, traditional methods, or a combination of both.